So, uh, Stephen Frost, thank you so much for taking the time to come on Forte Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here in pleasure, London. Pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much for making the effort to come. Uh, so, I like to start off the our discussion. Um, I'm very looking forward to what we're going to talk about today. Can we start off with music editing? Sure. Can you describe to us and to the audience who don't know what a music editor is, what is it in your own words? Well, <clears throat> the, the, the kind of dinner party answer I give to that question is um, I join up the good bits and take out the wrong notes. So, and that, that is essentially true. Um, at a recording session, uh, some people might be under the impression that uh, uh, a performer or an orchestra will play a piece once and that's recorded and that's what they hear on the radio or on their on their CD. Um, but that hasn't happened for 70 or 80 years. People will record the piece two or three times, maybe more. Uh, and they will also record shorter sections from within the piece. Uh, and my job is to, uh, as I say, join up the good bits, take out the wrong notes. Um, sometimes I do that under instruction from the record producer. So he, he supplies me with a, a marked up score. So he says... Um, you know, we, we start with take six and then I want to go into take eight at bar four and then take 10 at bar 16 and, and so on to the, get to the end. Um, or sp I do a little bit of producing myself, um, and the method is slightly different, um, I tend not to mark the score up at the, the time of the session because I know I'm going to be editing it. So I'll, I'll re-listen to everything afterwards and uh, make decisions as I go. Um, but, you know, in, in a nuts and bolts sense, that's what editing is. It's um, constructing uh, the best performance you, you can get out of the uh, material that you've recorded. Hmm. And when you're doing these takes, when you're doing multiple takes of, say, a particular bar or a particular section, and then you move on to another section where you're doing multiple takes as well of that section, when you're doing this and you're going through the piece, do you keep in mind what kind of, I guess, character you're trying to build throughout all these takes and picking out which ones are the best ones? Because sometimes different takes can, albeit good, both takes, they might have a different character. So do you keep in mind the character as well when you're doing different takes and choosing and selecting as well? Do you mean do you, whilst recording? Whilst recording, yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, uh, I, I mean, normally, you know, when one is, of course, working with um, professional and experienced musicians, they kind of know that that's what they need to do is is match the character. Uh, on the other hand, um, I have found that uh, some of the really, really great musicians um, that I've been lucky enough to work with, they actually vary more. They uh, are slightly uh, looser in their interpretation each time. So that can make uh, editing more difficult. Uh, and the solution to that is to generate as much material as you can at the time and then uh, make the right decisions in the edit suite afterwards, or hopefully mm. one does one's best <laughs> to do so. so. So despite getting a good take, even in the first few, do you record more just in case as a safety measure? in the editing process, do you have enough material to draw on if something does happen like like we just mentioned? Yes, yes. I, I think um, 
Well, when when I'm producing, and as I say, I don't do much of that. I, I tend to only work with people who ask me to, people who uh, uh, you know I know on a personal level. Um, so it doesn't say producer on my passport, but um, I, uh, uh, yeah, I I I get them to or ask them to just just play as much as possible and each time you uh repeat a section i always think there must be a new reason for doing that it it's it's not it doesn't work really to say uh let's just do another one for safety um if anything i would say let's do another one for danger to to do it and do it differently because um, if you, if you if you join the the first half of take one to the second half of take two, what you've got is something completely new, something that never happened in the in the studio at the time. I mean, it might not work, uh, but it, it also could be something really exciting. Um, and that's a very exim- simple example uh, of two sections joined together with one edit and actually we're talking about um well many many edits for a a recording um so does that answer your question Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Um, and when does people skills come into play when it comes to music editing and also producing I th- I think an editor doesn't need any people skills at all. Uh, I, not really, because uh, you're, you're locked away in a darkened room for six hours or <laughs> more. Um, if you if you go in with people skills, you probably come out with none because <laughs> you, you've never you haven't interacted with anybody. Um, a producing, of course, is yeah, it's absolutely essential. I th- I think producing just like football managing is uh, that the num- number one skill is psychology, human psychology. Um, saying the right thing to the right person at the right time to get the right result. It, it doesn't always work, but that's what, what you endeavor to do, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and different musicians react very differently to, to different, uh, different things that you might say or ask for. Mm. I mean, some uh, I know. I know one musician I work for, uh, work with, well, and for he um, he will just he just loves going, playing, 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 until you know he's a violinist until the blood is coming out of his fingertips. Other musicians will will balk at that because they'll they'll tail off very quickly. They'll lose energy or inspiration. Uh, and you have to recognise what kind of person you're working with and push them in the direction that they already want to go. Hmm. And also the pressure of having a time limit as well because days cost cost money too. So saying the right thing at the right time to get the results as quickly as possible. Well, that's the caveat to to everything that I'm I'm saying, which is all very, you know, uh, highfalutin and grand. But... Um, uh, yeah, time is absolutely of the essence, and you, you know sometimes you 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 there's not there isn't time to say, oh, can we please have this for this this wonderful musical reason? Actually, you just say, can we have this? And we've got one minute left to get it. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you afterwards why. Uh, so that's um, yeah, particularly with uh, an orchestral session, you know, time is absolutely of the essence. You'd never have enough. Yeah. Uh, when did you get your first experience, either music editing or music producing? Can you tell us a story behind behind these or, or one of those if you have one? Uh, music editing, I started in um, about 1988, I think. Uh, sim- and I, I, it was because a, a friend of mine was already, that it was their job, they worked at uh, Abbey Road at the time. Uh, but he was about to go freelance and he said, I'm going to need a bit of help. Do you want to help? And I, I said, uh, yeah, I'll have a go. 
and uh, I think the you know the first two or three records I made were were just dreadful. He had to re-edit them basically. <clears throat> didn't have an eye, didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, but you know you you learn from experience, you learn from doing it, and uh, I didn't make a complete fool of myself. And eventually, it was you know I was I was I was doing all right, and I've done it ever since. So that's how that started. Producing, um, yeah, as I say, I, haven't, I don't do much of it, but um, I did a bit in the, in the 90s when I worked for a company called Floating Earth, and uh, that was a time uh, where uh, everybody was re-recording everything because the CD was still relatively new. Um, <clears throat> so there were more records being made than producers. So I, I did a few things then, and I've just dipped my toe in from time to time since then. Mm. What, what were you editing in those early days? You said you were editing three three um, things. Do you remember what they were? Um the very first thing I edited was um, Pletnev playing Haydn uh, piano sonatas. Uh, and I also did some uh, Richard Hickox. Uh, what did he do? The Sea Symphony, Vaughan Williams Sea Symphony. I, remember, I still remember that really well because it was a, I thought it was an amazing performance. Mm -hmm. An amazing recording, not not really anything to do with my input, uh, but um, yes, I. It's difficult for me to remember now most of the records that I've made because I've, I have been involved with so many. Mm. A few stand out, I suppose. I did. I did quite a lot of work uh, editing um, Simon Rattle when he was in Birmingham. Oh, that was fun. That's, um, uh, yeah, some memorable recordings there, some Mahler symphonies and, and so on. What made it fun? Well, it was just good. It was just great playing. And uh, um, you always know <clears throat> when when you're working on something special, uh because the nature of the job is that you're constantly starting and stopping. You have to, you know, you're listening to this bit, you're listening to that bit, you're editing sometimes very short sections together. And you know what you've got is special if you can't bear to press the stop button. The, you know, the music is just uh, insisting that you carry on. So it, it doesn't take longer. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, that's happened. That happens quite a lot. Mm. Keeps you going. In those early days of music editing, at that time when you were that age, did you have any thought of continuing this into the future? Was that your ambition to, to carry it on? Or did you have other ambitions in mind at that time? Um, I, and, and, oh, that's, that's a really good question. I don't think I... Obviously, I didn't, it, since I find that difficult to answer. I don't think I thought I'd be doing it for the next 35 years. Um, I always had an ambition to make films, which we may come to talk about or not. Um, uh, but, yeah, it, it, certainly in the early days, editing was um it was a job and it was a job that i loved doing and um uh didn't want to do anything else uh yeah i don't yeah i don't think it was an ambition really it was just what i was doing mm. Mm. you were so in the present i think so I you think enjoyed it the, so much that's the way to put it yeah see that's for audiences to take notes yeah just enjoy what you're doing and you have a long career. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned filmmaking because I, I do really want to talk about it. Um, I, I would love to have your thoughts on a few things. Um, for example, 
the, f- the first question I want to ask is, why? What is it about filmmaking that has gripped you so? What, what is it about it? Is it about creating something from nothing and creating this this world for others to live in for a brief moment? Well, it is actually related to music for me quite strongly. Um, I, I'm sure it's not an unusual thing at all to be, you know, sitting uh, as a 14-year-old with my headphones on listening to, oh, I don't know, Yes or Emerson, Lake and Palmer or something and constructing a, a narrative to go along with yeah. this piece of music. That we, yeah, a lot of people do that. Maybe everybody does. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to actually make that happen. I wanted to tell a story um, partly by using music. And I, I do, I have sort of half joked at saying that I, the films that I have made, I've made as an excuse to write the music for them. <laughs> um, which is not entirely true. There's there obviously there's more to it than that, but that that's there's an element, a grain of truth in that. Um, but if, wow, you're you're asking a really big question about why we want to tell stories to each other, and uh, uh, I'm not sure I've got an answer to that really, um, except that we we do we always have you know since we've sat around the the campfire telling stories to each other and, and film is just a, another way of doing it mm. as is playing music mm-hmm. do you think in images then if at that age you were thinking about how to make this say music into a into a, a pictorial narrative would you say that your natural way of thinking is in images rather than in words say yes I definitely would. I, f- I find words tricky, actually. Mm, me too, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I sort yeah. of find this, although I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it, I'm also aware that I'm constantly struggling to find the, the right word. Um, so w- words are not a natural way of communicating for me, I don't think. Uh, yes, I definitely see see pictures when I hear music I, st- I still do and the other way around of course I see things and hear music hmm. uh, I, I think we all have a sort of synesthesia uh, about us you know we we, we de- what's the word demarcate our senses as if they are f- five separate things um, but I think that there's a lot of crossover. I mean, particularly, I suppose, with what we see and what we hear. Um, I, I, I'm almost inclined to suggest that they are just two sides of the same coin. Hmm. Um, yeah. All interrelated in a very complex way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. As, as as everything is, really. Yes. <laughs> So I've been speaking to many photographers and um, one of the most common traits that I've come across with them was um, even when they're walking around the street, for example, and they're not on an assignment, they're just walking around without a camera, their mind has this way of intuitively thinking of everything as a potential picture. Yep. They always see, they, they walk past this busy street and they think to themselves, oh, I could make a really nice composition. Oh, I wish I had my camera to capture this moment. These, um, say, people interacting on a, on a park bench, there's something interesting about it. And the intuition to take a photo just, just comes to them. They don't even think about it. It just arrives. And I found that I had that too. Um, being a, a visual thinker like yourself too, um, and having done photography for maybe nearly te- over 10 years now. Um, I do have the same, I guess, intuition. Yep. Uh, not just in pictures, but also in 
uh, thinking th- thinking about things in movie frames as well. Oh, this interaction could be a really nice, I guess, dialogue scene in the movie, for example. Yeah. Or this could be a very nice picture. Do you share that same trait of seeing everything around you, even though you're not on assignment not for anything? You think this could make a really good frame. Um. I think I might disappoint you by saying uh, I'm not sure that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, well, I I find that um, I'm more inclined to. It. Let me start that again. If I if I see something that you might want to frame, I think I might want I might see the seed of a story. Mm. So I would, uh, you, you probably, in that situation, feel inclined to get the camera out and take a picture. I would be more inclined to write something down, write some dialogue or a, describe a, a, a scene um, as part of a, a potential film script or something. Would that be only limited to people or would that be also extended to inanimate objects you see that would spur on i think it's probably likely to be people just people likely to be i'm trying to think if an inanimate situation has inspired um the thread of a story Mm. um i don't know i am working on a story about a uh, a puppet which you could argue is inanimate (laughs) um uh, but uh, yeah, people. I think is the is the answer. Mm. Well, I mean, ma- sorry, well, no, no. I mean, what is the world without people? Well, you could argue it'd be better, but uh, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> That's for another podcast. <laughs> yes. What makes a good story for you, or a good screenplay? What What are the elements that make it impactful for an audience, for example? Gosh, good questions here. Um, wow, I'm finding that that really difficult to answer. But, and I think part the reason I'm finding it difficult to answer is that if I start to think about it, the 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 answer that I'm looking for goes further away. <laughs> um, it's it's like uh, you know if you ask somebody how they um, or think about how you're driving a car while you're driving, you don't do it as well. Mm. You know, that, so that thinking process gets in the way. Mm. Or even playing a musical instrument, of course. If you, of course, you do have to think about what you're doing. Um, but, uh, prep, well, be interesting to see what your opinion of this is. But I think it's certainly in a performance situation, mm. you, you sort of have to stop thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, because it just it gets in the way. Yes. Um, yes. It's it's fine to think about it when you're practicing, and um, not only fine but essential. Um, so yeah, I've drifted a long way from your question, but um, I I can the the scripts that I have written, I have started without knowing how they were going to end, so I don't. Um, I don't have a plan. Um, and that that's the same sort of thing, is not thinking, not allowing logical thought to, to impede um, one's creativity such as it is. What leads you then, if it's not logic? Would it be emotion that leads you? Yes, certainly. And um, I, I know it's a, it's a terrible sort of cliche to talk about characters in your story that tell you where it's going next but they really do they really do you know your if your character in your uh, if you have plotted it and your expectation is that they're going to hit the butler over the head with a piece of lead piping if your character says no i i can't do that you you have to believe them. You have to change your your plot. 
Um, and I think you, uh, I would also say that's how you play a piece of music as well. If you, um, if you stick too closely to a plan, uh, if you're not careful, you, you, you're, you're sort of, you're hemmed in by the, the, the railway tracks that you've, you've put yourself on. And I, I, I think, um, you know, the, the best approach to a, a performance of a piece of music is I wonder what's going to happen. Hmm. So, so figuring out the ending first, which some people do, the reason being that it gives them some reassurance that this thing will end. <laughs> yep. This thing will be completed, which yep. is totally fine if, if that allays the anxieties. So would um, figuring out an ending be like hemming in on a, on a, on a, on a track for you? Um, I'd be careful about it. I think, um, you know, there are loads of fabulous writers who plot their book or script meticulously. They know exactly what's going to happen and they stick to it. I think William Boyd does that and I love his books. <clears throat> um, and he says, well, it's just much more efficient. I haven't got time to mess <laughs> about, basically. Uh, and he's, he's right, of course. Um, I, uh, Ian McEwan, I think, has done it both ways. He's, uh, he pl I think he said he plotted Amsterdam, which won the booker, pl plotted it on literally on the back of an envelope. Whether he was slightly exaggerating, I don't know. But, uh, but he's also written on, you know, by the seat of his pants. He's started and not knowing where it's going. Mm. So both work. Um, I, I think it's absolutely fine to uh, have an ending, to think that you know what the ending is going to be, but if in the process of attempting to get there you you end up somewhere else then allow yourself to do that mm. i think that that's all really um don't don't stick to that ending because that's easy yeah yeah Giorgio used to say um writing for him was like suffering a bout of illness um and i've heard people say that writing can be painful for them mentally um possibly uh, from writer's block and trying to get past that. Mm -hmm. um, I've been um, subject to that experience too. It is quite mentally, <laughs> mentally torturous. Um, I, but but having gone through that, they're, they're very glad to have written this. Ernest Hemingway used to say, you know, it, do you relate to that as well? Or is writing quite easy? Not easy, but relatively, I guess, not torturous. <laughs> Well, I suppose it, it varies a bit. I, I l really love working very early in the mornings, particularly when it comes to writing, um, because I haven't yet fully woken up. And going back to what we were saying before, that, that logical part of your brain hasn't... That, that takes longer to wake up, I think. Um... So if I'm sitting down to write at, uh, you know, 20 past six in the morning, it's easier just to let go of, of any inhibitions that my, I might otherwise have and, and just write and kind of be thrilled by the blank page rather than intimidated by mm, it. Mm. What, what can I put on this? Uh, wow, what's going to happen? Um, it might be good. Might not be. <laughs> Uh, often isn't, but um, the, you don't give yourself time to think about it, really. Mm. Uh, you know, you can always edit later. You can start again, take out the stuff that doesn't work, reorder it, do what you like. But the actual act of, if, if you, uh, you know, if you want to call it creation, um has to happen oh, oh, as if outside of yourself. I don't believe it is really. I believe it comes from within, but it feels like it comes 
from outside and uh so the the trick is to create a, an environment where that that's more likely to happen mm. do you ever read before you write read other works that inspire you or read authors that have played a huge part in your development as a writer do you ever read before you create anything i read a lot um i d- actually don't read much fiction these days um with with regret really um i'm not quite sure <clears throat> why that is i've heard a lot of people of my generation say that they read less fiction and read more uh, non-fiction um i i i i i'm not quite sure why why that is or what the consequence of it is um but i get a lot of um uh, ideas for my fictional narrative from non-fiction just as you know you can get your ideas from the newspaper i mean that's real life that uh, a lot of stories spring from that kind of source so um i don't i don't read fiction in order to help my fiction I just read it for for its own sake, mm-hmm. for the fun of it. Mm-hmm. As not to say it doesn't influence me. Everything influences uh, one, no doubt about it. But uh, yeah, if you had to speculate why you read fiction, non-fiction now, what would the reason be? If you had to, giving you all the hard questions today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if there was one reachable theory of all that well uh, for me it's uh, you know this sounds terribly grand but it's about understanding the world which of course fiction is brilliant at helping you to do so I'm not even sure if that's that's a really a particularly good reason to give but that's what I feel Um, I'm uh, plowing my way through uh, a book in fact it's two books two massive volumes called um, uh, The Matter with Things by Ian McGilchrist who mm. is a do you know it? Yes uh, I don't know the book but I know the the, the person you Yes about, yeah. uh, he also wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary which yes, is about the um, difference between the left and right hemispheres which I I I find really fascinating in fact i found his book kind of life-changing in what way well it explains a lot if you if he's right (laughs) um how our our brain is split um not in the sort of um simplistic way that we used to think that the left hemisphere does this and the right hemisphere does that actually both hemispheres do everything but they do things in different ways Anyway, you should watch his YouTube videos uh, for that explanation because he's much more clued up on it than I am. Um, but I, the the point I'm making is that kind of book feeds into the kind of stories I want to tell, which are often about uh, psychology, and I'm I'm fascinated by what happens when the brain doesn't work as well as it should um so reading non-fiction is a good source of of material for that yeah just adding on you know sometimes real life can be even better than than fiction itself the content in real life stranger than fiction (laughs) it certainly can yes uh i mean there are some things that happen in real life and you say you could not possibly put that in a book. (laughs) You would never get it published. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So talking about people who, uh, you know, life-changing books, um, what other books have changed your your life? Any Uh, fiction? Yeah. um, Well, the book that immediately springs to mind, which which polarizes a lot of people, is The Magus by John Fowles, who was, that was published in about 1968. 
Um, and even he described it as an adolescent book. Uh, so that's the time to read it, really. And that's when I read it, when, I don't know, I was 20 or something. <clears throat> and I've read it subsequently, and it, it, it doesn't, doesn't quite cut it anymore for me. Uh, but at the time, that was another life-changing book. And it's, it's a sort of rambling um, stream of consciousness thing about a, uh, a young uh, teacher who goes to see, teach English in, on a Greek island and uh, encounters, well, magical or what appear to be magical phenomena. And uh, I, I love it, but... Some people absolutely hate it. So, uh, and that's a, that's a book I don't think would uh, would get published now. It's just too crazy. <laughs> it's of its time. Yeah. But yeah, that 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 uh, it was an influential book mm. for me. When you were when you were younger and starting out, did you have a tendency to, I guess, emulate the career path of your your idols, whoever whoever they may be? Well, my idols were either footballers, and I really, really did want to be a footballer. How far, and did, I, how I was, far did you get? Uh, nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite good. Uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, probably not good enough to have become a professional footballer. I was a bit of a late developer physically, so uh, the, the, the other boys were just... They got bigger, quicker than I did, sooner than I did. And uh, it doesn't matter how good you are. They just, you know, brush you <laughs> off and that's it. Um, so Lee, apart from football, I, I really, really wanted to be um, Rick Wakeman, uh, Keith Emerson. They're, they're real heroes of mine. Um particularly Keith Emerson, actually. Uh, that, yeah, prog rock, that was really my thing in my formative years. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, for all its, um, you know, pompous uh, uh, stuff that was, that was going on, and it really did become very pompous, uh, even I thought so, I think. It what, what attracted me to it partly was this the the big scale of it. You know, they didn't do songs; they did twenty-minute epics um, that told a story that had a narrative. Very often, so uh, um, yeah, that was those, those would be my heroes. Seems like story is a very big part for you. Anything with a story, anything with a narrative. Definitely, yes. But then I would say everything is a story, really, one way or another. Everything has a beginning, a middle and an end. Hmm. So um, I suppose, um, you know, uh, I'm drawn to formalising that in a way that it's, you know, a, a story with a capital S. Going on to story and... Um everything having a story has writing a memoir ever intrigued you in any way at any point you know writing it at any point in your life you know no not at all no i wouldn't what i well i would quite like to put down in writing uh just for us now to sort of come full circle i suppose is my feelings about music editing because of all the you know sort of crazy things I've done um it you know it's it's the thing I've I've done most of and and I uh, know most about and know the effect that it has on music and the effect that it's had on the recording industry and the effect that the recording industry has had on the way people play music so there's a kind of feedback loop about um you know, this recording is so perfect, therefore my concert needs to be. Mm. Because 
we've now set up an audience expectation that everything a musician does is technically perfect. Mm. Um, so I'd love to write about that. Do you think we've gone the wrong way when it comes to concert expectations? Striving for too much perfection. What are your, th um, what are your thoughts? Well, on it's, uh, gosh, that's a really dangerous area to get into because my inclination is to say yes, but I, th I think it's much more, the answer is much more complicated mm. than that. You know, I've been to some absolutely fabulous concerts that change your life. Um, either at the time or you know sometimes permanently you know you'll never be the same person again mm. so uh, the music always comes through um, when it's you know when it's played with honesty mm. and integrity um, but I, th I think there is a bit of a battle uh, between the notes and the music they're, they are, they are the, those two things get conflated and they're not the same thing at all. Mm. Mm. When we're and in in a, in a in a recording session environment, there is a danger that it can feel like a practice session because it you're encouraged for good reason to start to analyze what you're doing. And you, you literally go go into the control room and listen back to what you've done, and that will obviously have an effect on how you go out there again and and, and play it. Um, so you're you're analysing and you're you're picking it apart, and and you're also getting a bit hypersensitive about. Uh, you know this passage or that passage. Oh, I wish I could do it that way or. Uh, I keep playing the same wrong note in that bar. Uh, and that kind of, um, that mentali mentality can, if you're not careful, it can infect your performance. Uh, and that will end up on the record. Mm. Um, but, you know, we, we are talking about amazing musicians who kind of know that actually and they get they don't let it happen mm. most of the time mm -hmm. just a, a a final remark i have to wrap up the the podcast now but i wish we could talk for much longer um for the listeners who are watching this episode who are either wanting to get into composing they want to get into filmmaking writing or all three um we we talk about i guess the I idea of success is how many awards you have people some people measure their success that way by the quantity of how many awards they have how many things they've published for example or composed or directed um, but what would your advice be to someone who wants to do those things, composing, filmmaking, writing, so that they can feel content with their work? Not worry about how many awards they have, just just feel content with what they've made. Uh, well, um, uh, Bob Dylan said that success is getting up being able to get up in the morning and do what you want to do. Uh, so I, th I think that's very true. Um, I've done what I've done. God, it sounds like a stupid sentence to say, but I've done what I've done by doing it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I made my first short film by going out and buying a camera and pointing it at things and editing it and you know I was extremely fortunate with that in that it did win an award and the award you know, it was nice to get um, but it, it's I suppose it gave me a bit of validation I thought oh well maybe I'm doing something right <clears throat> uh, 
and th- of course that's also thanks to other people making a film is not a one person job by any means um yeah i i i don't know if i'm the right person to ask for advice because i i've just done stuff i've i've written music um because i wanted to and again incredibly fortunate that um you know a a piece of music got picked up by a, a record label and they wanted to release it and um that 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 just happened but it it could have gone the other way it could easily have gone the other way just do it do do what you love to do that that absolutely is at the bottom line of everything uh and something will happen i'm sure it might not be what you expect but um don't don't do what other people expect you to do um don't don't do what you think will keep other people happy because that won't make you happy and it probably won't make them happy either <laughs> So uh, this is the best I can come up with. And also, I may add, if I may add something, don't think too much about what you're doing now and its impact in the future. Just do what you do now and just enjoy it. And just let whatever happens in the future happen. If, win in the war, if it wins in the war, it wins in the war. But don't think, I'm going to make this to win in the war. I think that's what people get bogged down on. Yeah, well, that's very good advice. Yes, um, it's hard not to think about the future, but um, uh, you 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 can't uh, you can't force it or predict it. It'll it'll be what it'll be. Um, it's well, it's a bit like you know writing the story without knowing the end, isn't it? Exactly. Well, Stephen Frost, what a nice way to tie up the ending, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Stephen Frost, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.